Lunchtime talk on the last day. Let's do it. Good energy. I'm Jordan. Uh, I'm not a traditional neuroscientist, uh, a, a traditional <laughs> uh, 3D artist. I am a neuroscientist uh, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in the US. I, uh, <laughs> APL. <laughs> Uh, I live in Philadelphia, which is not important to the talk, but it is. Um, uh, Philadelphia has the, the unique distinction of being the only city in the world where the ice hockey team is blender themed. <laughs> <laughs> I study the brain, I study how healthy nervous systems work and what goes wrong with them in disease. Reverse engineering the brain is a monumental task, but not only does it teach us about what it means to be human, we can also learn what goes wrong. Lots of neurological disorders and diseases like dementia and epilepsy and paralysis can stem from faulty neural circuits. So if we can understand how the circuits work, we can understand how to diagnose and treat these disorders. As Francesco mentioned in, in the, uh, the keynote, and I, I think a lot of us can, re can relate to the story of downloading the uh, Blender splash screen files, the dot blend files, and like dissecting them to see how they work. And in general, it's, it's true that when you want to understand how systems work, w what do you do? You, you take them apart, and you look at the computational units, and you look at how those units fit together. In the brain, neuron cells are the computational units, and they fit together at synapses. We call this wiring diagram the connectome. Ever since the earliest days of neuroscience, we've understood the brain first and foremost by looking at it. This is a drawing by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, one of the first neuroscientists to ever see a neuron under a microscope. And he sketched it in ink on paper, this uh, drawing, I think, from the, the 1890s. Today, we can look with much stronger microscopes than these light microscopes, and we can reconstruct neurons in three dimensions instead of two dimensions. And that's critical, because the way that neurons interact in the brain in 3D and occupy 3D space is a fundamental key to the mystery. This is what that process looks like. You take a super powerful microscope, perhaps an electron microscope. You slice the tissue really, really thin. You image each slice. And then you digitize those, align the stack, and then you reconstruct them in 3D. Once you have your raw imagery in 3D, then you go in with a, here you can see a little uh, a screencast of me literally tracing a single uh, neuron in this volume by hand. Um, you can see that um, each of the neurons is kind of separated by this dark uh, uh, black wall that's a cell membrane. And then inside, they've got all sorts of, of goodies, like mitochondria. We can see some, some vesicles here. And if this looks kind of tedious, it's because it is. If we were to try to do something even as small as a, a mouse brain, uh, we expected this would take over 100,000 years of human labor. Not tenable, unless you guys are interested. <laughs> um, but of course, there's now machine learning techniques that, that uh, get us closer. Um, here is an annotated stack. We assign one color per neuron. And I'll remind you, of course, that this is still just the starting data, right? So we, we have um, uh, all of our, our neurons segmented, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've learned anything new about them. We just simply have image segmentation now. But I've had the uh, incredible honor of being part of the uh, Microns Consortium, which was a group that mapped hundreds of thousands of neurons and hundreds of millions of synapses in the mouse brain, building, uh, at the time, the largest map of its kind of uh, neural tissue in history. That means that today, we can now start to move beyond simply building maps. We can use those maps to start to make discoveries about how the brain actually works. The data sets that I'm showing here span petabytes of imagery, hundreds of thousands of voxels in each direction. And they've been under constant analysis since their creation. But these data sets are so massive that it's more than likely that human eyeballs will never actually see everything that these data sets have to offer. And this is good for, I'm going I'm to take a quick slide. No, actually, I was just talking to, to Sivrin uh, yesterday, two days ago, about did you know that if you render from the viewport, 
right, and you you like do like the you know render render viewport animation, uh, it inherits your like your uh, render settings for all your modifiers. And I was like sitting uh, at my computer like a week ago. I'm like, come on, render faster, render faster, render faster, because I don't have a render farm. I do all of this stuff on my laptop. And I was like, why is it taking so long? It's because it's using all of my. <laughs> Subdivision surfaces and, and things that, uh, in any case, fine. So that, that's all good for a neuroscience conference, but, but we're not at a neuroscience conference, we're at a Blender conference. So today I want to share with you two stories of what happens when you take data sets like these, and you take a tool like Blender, and you give neuroscientists the opportunity to actually look at the data, like Santiago Ramon Cajal looked at his data all those years ago. This is a slice of a fruit fly brain. This is the same slice. Now I've colored in a few of the, the neurons so you can see them. And I, I'm going to look uh, in particular at that little green island in the middle. We knew that this was a cell type that was super important to the computational substrate of the fly brain, but it's hard to have a full appreciation of the scale or the complexity or what this system is, is trying to accomplish. So you know, we know that green dot is important. And beyond that, it starts to get more complicated to, to analyze. And I will remind you, of course, that when we look at data like this, you know, this is, this is not a two-dimensional object. This is a three-dimensional object. Um, it's much harder to explain that to people at a neuroscience conference and at a Blender conference. But this complex 3D shape, um, I'm going to start panning through, uh, uh, scrubbing through Z slices, right? So we're moving, you know, this is not an animation. This is, a, um, this is just 3D space. Um, but as we start to zoom out, you can, you can see this in the, the scope of the entire fruit fly hemisphere. Um, and, and here, we're, we're loading in, swapping in and out data. This is about a 500 terabyte data set. Um, and you can start to get an appreciation of how important things can be, and yet how small and how sparse in this data set. When instead we pull the morphology of these cells into Blender, things become much clearer. And we can finally start to see complete cells. Manipulating this system in 3D helped us to understand that we're looking at a convergent synapse this super complicated blob over here, a special kind of connection where a bunch of neurons all converge at a single location and synapse on a downstream target within 300 nanometers of each other. We now know there's, there's this, this same green, green island. We now know that convergent synapses are super important for encoding nonlinearity in the brain. What's nonlinearity? Well, it's a way of combining information from your upstream targets um, in order to form more sophisticated functions. We know that nonlinearity is fundamental to deep learning. Modern machine learning algorithms don't work without nonlinearities. And so there's lots of reasons to believe that this system, which encodes nonlinearity in the, in the brain, is fundamental for learning and memory. And these interpretations are only possible with visualization and appreciating the 3D structure and anatomy and really giving scientists the opportunity to spin it around and think about it and uh, view it like with tools that, that everybody in this room is used to every day. Um, I want to tell another story now, this time in uh, humans, um, in the spinal cord rather than in the brain and with considerably smaller data. The spinal cord is like a bundle of, I can't believe I'm like the third person to show a spinal cord in this talk, in this conference. I was like, I was like oh, I'm gonna show them some science. We have like a whole science ensemble here. It's so cool. This is the spinal cord. Uh, different levels branch out down your back like exits on a highway. And those nerve roots innervate the same places in everybody. So if you've got an injury in a certain area of the spinal cord, then based upon the location, we can generally tell what the, the implications are going to be for health. Um, spinal cord injury is, is of course, um, uh, has huge impacts on, on motor function. You might even know somebody who, who has been uh, impacted by um, motor impairments from, from spinal cord injury. Um, there's also enormous implications for, for autonomic function, so uh, blood pressure, heart rate, going to the bathroom, major long-term consequences for quality of life with spinal cord injury. Treatment is super, super hard. Uh, up until just a few years ago, fixing these types of injuries was nearly impossible. But there are new treatments on the market now. Uh, one technique known as epidural stimulation, uh, we implant an electrode against the spinal cord. That electrode can speak the same electrical language as the neurons and it reactivates the neural circuits below that point of injury. 
But there's a challenge. That electrode paddle is super tiny. It's about 10 millimeters wide. Or for the Americans in the audience, that electrode is super tiny. <laughs> so we have a challenge. We've got this tiny electrode paddle, and we have a very narrow spinal cord in a really, really busy part of the body. Um, I thought that the, the anatomical visualizations from the, the talk earlier today here were, were super cool and really illustrated the fact that there's a ton of stuff going on in there. I'm not going to show you any pictures of, of surgery or the, or the operating room or anything, but it's a really crowded working environment in there. So it's critical that you plan the surgery perfectly. Now, we can get MRI to plan that, so we can, we can take imagery of the, of the uh, individual prior to surgery, but what we need is some sort of software that we can manipulate and view 3D data. <laughs> we know software like that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Blender. <laughs> Let me do a really quick detour, and I'm going to uh, uh, share how I render MRIs. Now, this is like the least awesome way of rendering uh, uh, volumes that has been shared all week. But we're going to take the, the MRI, and we're going to render each slice into a really, really long film strip. So that you can see in my image editor, I've got slice after slice in just this long, concatenated image. Then I'm going to UV map that to a uh, really, really long plane. I'm going to subdivide that plane, and then I'm going to separate off each face so that I can access uh, each uh, Z slice of the volume individually. Can manipulate those. Then we're going to take all of those slices. We're going to rotate them by 90 degrees. Squish them together. Volume. <laughs> you can see I'm fiddling with the, um, the alpha slider in my, in my shader, and I can uh, selectively uh, um, knock in or knock out different tissue types. So for example, I just yanked out some of the soft tissue, but I left in the bone for, the, for this visualization here. Like I said, that's a super, super basic approach. You can get a little bit more sophisticated. Um, here, um, I've got some, uh, some float curves where I'm able to uh, specify the densities in the, in the MRI that I care about and make the rest invisible. If you want to be a little bit more clever, um, there's a fabulous add-on bioxal nodes, which does biomedical visualization. Um, now, of course, extraordinary support for, for VDB in, in Blender. Um, if you want to get really, here's, a, here's the Blender success story. Check out this visualization. This is a butterfly retina that I rendered last night sitting in the hotel in my pajamas. <laughs> and it's thanks to the incredible work of Afka, who's sitting right here. So all of the awesomeness of, uh, of this visualization is thanks to Afka. <laughs> Really cool. If that's not a Blender conference success story, I don't know what is. That is so awesome. So here's what our full process looks like. We load the patient's MRI imagery using a volume technique. Um, we've published an open source library that you'll notice I forgot to link to, but if you ask me for it later, I can, I can share how we do all of this stuff um, through, through um, uh, Python. Uh, then we, we use that to generate volumetric shaders. So um, you can see here that I've got the imagery loaded in, and I can either generate uh, volume materials or surface materials. Let's start with my, my volume. Um, and you can see that I can uh, manipulate, carve out different tissue types, like I was showing earlier. When I switch into surface mode, you'll see that I can, I can get a new uh, representation of the data just um, at, the, at the surface level, but in, in both the uh, surface shader and the, the volume shader, I can switch into edit mode like I will do perhaps in, in a second in the video, but I'm talking faster than I did when I was practicing. Um, grab a face, and I can carve into that volume, and I can perform my dissections in, in real time in Blender, and because we're pinning the tissue to world coordinates, um, we are able to manipulate this, these planes and, and operate at any axis that we want, not just the cutting planes of the MRI scanner. Um, for, for us in the biomedical field, that's really exciting. <laughs> for folks in Blender, going off axis is, is nothing special. <laughs> Separately, we have a geometry node set up uh, that, that renders the actual anatomy. So we have a Python marching cubes implementation that we've pulled into a, uh, a, a Blender add-on that marching cubes converts the volumes into mesh surfaces. And now we can uh, 
take each of those mesh surfaces and then render those here. You can see my relatively simple geometry nodes set up on, on the screen right now, where each tissue type, the, the bones, the intervertebral space, the, the meninges, the nerve roots, like those, those high, highway exits we were talking about, um, we can add and remove and manipulate in 3D. If you are using Blender 4.5, or perhaps even Blender 5.0, as many are now, you have access to the, the import nodes, and these made my geometry nodes graph go from you know, hundreds of, of nodes to those, these very, very simple little things that you, that you just saw. And, and so I wanted to take a moment to, to thank the awesome developers um, that, that made that possible, uh, because that was really a, a huge quality of life improvement for the development of, of these sorts of workflows. Really, really important stuff. And so I want to make sure you guys know how much I appreciate it. So great, now we have our reconstructions in 3D, and we can start to plan where the paddle needs to go. You can see I've got these uh, super photorealistic renders on the screen right now. I'm just kidding, it's obviously not, not, not very photorealistic. You know, symbolic, right? Like the colors mean things, help you differentiate tissue types. If I was going for photorealism, there would of course be no moths. <laughs> like... <laughs> And we can, of course, then export this stuff uh, through the, the new uh, GLTF and GLB exporters to generate this little browser tool that I've got that we can send a single HTML file over the wire to our surgeons, who can then look at the anatomy. They can see the, you know, this coordinate frame uh, numbers running down the, the screen, which is super critical for wayfinding in the anatomy, uh, switch anatomy on and off. Mm, you guys have seen 3JS before. What's the upshot? Our work inside of Blender has led to faster surgeries and more successful paddle placements. We're able to cover 20% more of the enlargement. In other words, that's really, really, really good. Take my word for it. And we've taken these really sophisticated, complicated surgeries from three hours, four hours, maybe five hours, down to between two and three hours. Faster surgery means easier, less risk to the patient. And the surgeon who's working in these really sensitive spaces can have less fatigue and more confidence in the placement because this is not their first time seeing the tissue in three dimensions when they walk into the operating room. With Blender, there has been an extraordinary improvement in the quality of the healthcare that we're able to provide. And the differences to our individuals with spinal cord injury is enormous. So I, I wanted to, to take the last moment to sincerely thank the incredible research leadership, um, Susie, Eric, Pat, Fra, and Brock, who are the visionaries behind much of the research that I shared here today. And I also want to sincerely thank the, the Blender engineers and the community and the audience here today, because every time you test a new feature or you submit a bug report or you add a pull request or you share Blender with somebody else and you make our community bigger and richer, you make research like this possible. So everybody in the room, I think, has had their life changed in, in some way by Blender. And, and when you improve Blender, you improve the future of science and medicine for, for people like these two. So thank you.